Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Going Ballistic Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Kleckner. This is episode 22, and it should sound much better than the last few podcasts because I'm not doing it for my truck on the road. I'm actually back in my office this time. And I want to catch you guys up on some, I don't know, new events, some news I've seen from the industry. I decided I'm not going to talk about some more long range topics. One, because I'm kind of running out of some of the basics to cover for you guys. Um, But two, I've allowed so many of your emails to get lost into the mix. I apologize for that. I I try to respond to every single one I get. And being out of doing the podcast regularly, I'm uh, not saving them as well to folders for ideas. So if you have an idea for a podcast that I haven't covered, you've already sent it. I apologize. Please send it again if you'd like me to cover it or anyone else reach out uh, with an idea you'd like me to cover. The problem is some of the questions you guys have are a little too involved for me to cover on a podcast. Uh, either just talking to myself, or it would be just such a rapid fire quick answers, it would just be um, maybe hard to listen to or follow along. So please send some out some more ideas. Uh, and if I ignored yours, again, I'm sorry. Those of you that have been listening to the last couple know I started a new project called Rocket FFL. Uh, that actually ties into one of the topics I wanted to talk about today. So Rocket FFL is what helps you get your own FFL become an SOT, and then stay compliant while you're doing it because there's a lot of rules and regulations out there. You know, Getting your FFL is not that hard. If you take the course through Rocket FFL, it walks you right through every single step of the process. And you're probably going to end up with an FFL as long as you don't live you know, in, a, in a spot or in an apartment in downtown New York City where you're probably not going to get one. But that's the easy part. The hard part then is figuring out how to comply with everything else. And if you do it on your own, It can get confusing or overwhelming, not only because there's so many rules and regulations to follow, but also you just don't know which ones they are. There's there's not one good resource because even if you go look at the law itself, that doesn't tell you what the ATF rulings say. The ATF rulings and opinion letters, and then it gets all over the place. So I offer some follow-on training for either import-exports or just ATF compliance generally. I even offer training for your employees so you can, for a simple course to sit down a brand new employee for their first hour on the job so they can just learn the basics of what an a and d book is what a firearm technically is what the markings need to be and things like that well some people when they hear me say that they say what do you mean what a firearm is it's pretty straightforward well no it's not uh, first off there's 80 percent quote unquote you know receivers which really aren't a real legal term anyway those can get complicated and there's new products that come up from manufacturers like the mossberg shockwave grip it's a 14 inch barreled shotgun. I hesitate to call it a shotgun because it's really not a shotgun, but it shoots shotgun shells and it's based off of a Mossberg 500 receiver that normally goes in shotguns. And uh, Remington looks like they're finally (laughs) coming to play the game too. And they've kind of announced a 14 inch barreled version of their own using that same, what they call the shockwave grip from that company. They haven't announced it publicly yet, but you can see uh, distributor emails and notices that they're coming out. So At least maybe they uh, took notice that, hey, Mossberg might have a good idea. We should do it too. But I'm happy that there's opportunities for other options out there. The problem is, how do you handle these things within the realm of firearms laws? Not only if you're a dealer, but if you're an individual, can you buy this thing? Is it a short-barreled shotgun? Is it an AOW or any other weapon? Uh, Can you buy it? Is it legal in your state? These are all really good questions. And I've been getting a lot of questions about this one. So let's discuss that a little bit. First, Mossberg actually reached out to me and asked me to write an article for them for this, for the shotgun helping describe what it is. So that was kind of cool. There's a, if you go to Mossberg's website and you look at in their blog, there's an article titled A Shotgun by Any Other Name or Is a Shotgun by Any Other Name Still a Shotgun? Uh, to, uh, it's like a hint at my nerdiness sometimes. That's, believe it or not, that's a play on a Shakespeare quote about a rose being any other name. But the idea is I wanted to get the words any other in there, like any other weapon, for you to figure out what it is. And in the article, I walk you through top to bottom um, whether this thing's a shotgun or not and why. But I'll give you guys the benefit that are listening uh, of the discussion now. So first off, you always have to go back to the basics of what a firearm is. So a firearm is in the law, quote, a weapon I shouldn't say quote because I'm paraphrasing here. This is off the top of my head. (laughs) So not quite quote. It is a weapon that's designed and intended to fire a projectile by the action of an explosive. So if there's a explosion or a boom and a projectile comes out, that's a firearm. 
That means air rifles aren't firearms, and potato guns, well, if the potato gun uses hairspray, it's a firearm because it's an explosion. But if it's a, a potato gun that works off compressed air, it's not a firearm because there's no explosion. So there's the definition of a firearm. And this Mossberg shockwave gripped firearm clearly is a firearm, okay? It shoots shotgun shells. Well, the next definitions you go to are the difference between long guns and handguns, you know, long guns being rifles and shotguns. A shotgun's definition is a firearm, we know what that is, that's designed and intended to be fired from the shoulder and has a smooth barrel. Notice it doesn't say fire a shotgun shell, that's irrelevant. The fact that it has a butt stock, so it's designed and intended to be fired from your shoulder, and the barrel is smooth, makes it a shotgun. That means if a firearm manufacturer made what they thought was a rifle, you know, in 30 6 but they forgot to rifle it, or they let the bar left the barrel smooth, well then technically that's a shotgun. And believe it or not, under federal law, a shotgun with a rifled barrel, there's a lot of those to shoot slugs, technically under federal law, that's a rifle. Because the definition for a rifle is a firearm designed and intended to be fired from the shoulder with a rifled barrel. That's it. It doesn't say the caliber or gauge or anything it needs to be. Now, don't freak out. I kept saying under federal law, because many states say that you have to hunt with shotguns and a rifled barrel is okay. And under state law, that's still a shotgun. So don't, don't freak out on me there. But that, that's the major difference. Well, this Mossberg 14-inch shockwave, which is what they call it, has a smooth barrel, but it's not designed and intended to be fired from the shoulder because the grip is kind of like a, a bird's head shaped grip. It's clearly meant to be held with just one hand and not be put against your body when it's fired. You're going to be fired just from the hand or maybe from the hip or something like that. So it can't be a shotgun because it's not designed and intended to be fired from the shoulder. Well, that also means it can't be a short barreled shotgun, which is a certain type of NFA firearm, which means, you know, you got to pay the tax, more registration. It's a lot harder to get. Because in order to be a short barreled shotgun, which is a shotgun with a barrel under 18 inches or an overall length under 26 inches, it can't be a short barreled shotgun because it's not a shotgun in the first place. So that's out. So the other category it possibly could be is an AOW or an any other weapon. And any other weapon is kind of a catch all category. I go figure, that's what the name sounds like. In the NFA, where there's different types of guns that can be in there. And one of the types of guns that can be in there is a handgun with a smooth barrel designed and intended to fire shotgun shells. Well, now that sounds pretty close to what we're dealing with here, right? This is a, a shotgun receiver with a short shotgun smooth barrel with just one grip in the back for one hand to grab. It starts to sound an awful lot like that handgun. Well, for example, like a, a Taurus Judge or a Smith Wesson Governor, those are both revolvers that fire shotgun shells. Well, those aren't AOWs, even though they're a handgun designed and intended to fire shotgun shells, because both of those have rifled barrels. Yes, because you can shoot 45 long colt out of them. That means if the manufacturers made that with a smooth barrel, it would be an AOW, it would be an NFA firearm. So back to the Mossberg 14-inch uh, shockwave. It's still not an AOW, because the first part of the AOW definition is a handgun. Well, that Mossberg... 14-inch uh, shockwave is over 26 inches in overall length because that grip doesn't go straight down. The grip angles back quite a bit, which gives you some overall length to the gun. Well, it's not a handgun or it's not in that category because another test is it needs to be readily concealable. Well, the ATF has determined that over 26 inches is not readily concealable. Therefore, it's not an AOW. Now, some folks say they don't think it's a handgun because it needs two hands because you're right. You need one hand to fire and then your other hand, your support hand, would be what operated the pump action of the firearm. But that's really not the case. It's it's because technically that would make it another kind of AOW if it was a handgun. Because if you take like an AR-15 pistol, for example, and you put a forward grip on it, that's a whole nother type of AOW because a handgun's definition is a firearm designed and intended to be fired with one hand. And once you put a foregrip on an AR-15 pistol, clearly it's not intended to be used with one hand. Is intended to be fired with both hands. Well, that doesn't apply to these shotguns because even though there's a spot up there for your support hand to rack the gun, that doesn't mean it's intended to be fired that way. For example, a Glock pistol is clearly a handgun, but it would require two hands to manually cycle the action on a Glock pistol. Just because it requires two hands doesn't make it not a handgun anymore. Well, the same is true for this Mossberg 14 inch shockwave. It requires two hands to manually cycle the action not necessarily to fire it. So that's not why it's not a handgun, if that makes sense. It's not a handgun because of its length. So 
Those things are perfectly legal under the Gun Control Act, which means under federal law, they are not NFA items. They are just like any other firearm you would buy. When you, when you fill out your 4473 at the dealer to purchase the thing, it should be listed as a pistol grip firearm. That's this weird category the ATF has given them so they can you know, track it in records better to understand what you're talking about. But it's definitely not NFA. And depending on your state, it's going to be perfectly legal for you to own. I think they're really handy, fun little guns. I mean, I, I don't, it doesn't replace an actual shotgun because shooting it from your shoulder is going to be way easier to shoot. Uh, and operate the gun and also with a short barrel on a pump action shotgun style action limits your round capacity that's the problem with shorter shotguns right is the magazine tube is under the barrel so short barrel and short magazine means low capacity but i think there's a huge uh, market and, and and use for these kind of things so remington of course like i said is, is kind of jumping to the game or it looks like they are to to follow mossberg's suit to come out with the same type of thing it's an 870 type receiver put into this firearm again not quite a shotgun it's a firearm now between the two which one am i going to get well i've always been partial to the remington 870s one there's a soft spot in my heart for remingtons and two just every time i've compared a mossberg 500 to a remington 870 i've always liked the 870 better the action seemed smoother it seemed like it was easier to operate. Uh, the lockup seemed more secure. I mean, just it looked like there was less kind of clunkiness or moving parts to it. Um, but that's an unfair determination, right? Because I was comparing some of my higher end 870s, some custom Vang Comp type 870s, to a, a Mossberg that may have been abused by somebody that had it. The more I look into it, the Mossberg 500s are actually a great platform. I mean, it's a really cool shotgun. And there's some features that lend itself to being perfect for this scenario. So for example, one of the reasons I might actually get the Mossberg 14 inch shockwave instead of the Remington is one, uh, quality lately, Mossberg has consistently good quality. It's not hit and miss, the finish stays on well. It, it, I hate to say it, but Mossberg is doing a little better lately on the quality department. Uh, that's one reason I might get the Mossberg one. Uh, another reason is they asked me to write the article for their website, so that was kind of nice that they reached out and maybe support the brand. But the biggest reason I might get the Mossberg 14-inch version over the Remington one is, is the controls, is the features of the actual firearm itself. See, normally, I, I like the 870 because I've gotten used to the safety behind the trigger, uh, especially if you put a pistol grip on a shotgun. It's much easier to operate that safety, whereas the Mossberg has the safety on the top rear you know, of the receiver. Good luck with a pistol grip on a shotgun trying to reach up and get that safety. It's just a pain. And so that all the shotguns I ever used in the military or even for competition shooting had the pistol grips on them. So that also ruled the Mossbergs out for me. Well, now, holding this 14-inch shockwave in your hand, your thumb is going to be lined up perfectly on the back of the receiver by the way that shotgun or that firearm has you grip it. Perfectly in line with where that thumb safety is going to be for the receiver. So now it's like, wow, that safety is actually in a really good spot to not have to reach down with your, you know, the inside edge of your, your trigger finger to try and get the safety, especially in this new, unique hand position you're going to have to have to fire these things. So on the safety alone, man, the Mossberg has got the perfect spot for the safety for this one. Well, the other reason I might do the Mossberg is because of another control. The actual bolt, slide, pump, action, release, whatever you'd call it. On a Remington, the release to open the, to unlock the chamber and open it up if you haven't fired it, is in front of the trigger guard. That's never been much of a problem for me when the gun's in my shoulder because it's easy to slide my right hand up and, and hit that release. But man, on this shockwave thing, that's a horrible position for it. It's, it's just not going to be conducive to trying to use the shotgun and maybe get a shell out of the chamber if I need to with that, that release up in front of the trigger guard. The Mossberg has the release right behind the trigger guard, right where my middle finger is going to be resting anyway. So if I need to, I can easily reach and rack open the shell. I guess there's a third reason, too, is the lifter on the 870, uh, which you need to push out of the way to load shells in, has never bothered me. You just push it up and then push the shell in. But the Mossberg's uh, floats up and out of the way, so it would make it even easier to load. And this might come into effect because when you're holding the device in only one hand and you're trying to load it, you don't have the opportunity to either put the buttstock on your shoulder or pinch the buttstock under your arm or get any of that extra support you might need on the firearm as you're pushing up against it to load shells. So I think the Mossberg is going to be a lot easier to load too. So it might actually be my first Mossberg 500 type receiver in my gun safes 
is to get one of these uh, because of the safety, because of the bolt release, because of the lifter on the bottom, and just because Mossberg reached out and had a really cool idea and they came out that I really like to support them and check it out. So you guys should go check them out too. Um, perfect, handy, little firearm. And it's fun just to have a, I don't know, a unique tool that I applaud the company for threading the needle a little bit and getting in and out around the laws to make a, a firearm that looks like it might be NFA, but not at all. So some other new products to talk about. Um, I'm kind of excited about the Magpul uh, Magwell for Glocks. <laughs> I'm a sucker for it. Magpul makes cool stuff. It's inexpensive. Some of it's actually bordering on cheap, but some of their other stuff is really kind of nice. I mean, their 700 rifle stocks are just awesome. They're one of the best budget ways to get a much needed upgraded stock to like a Remington 700 SPS Tactical or something with a completely unsuitable stock. That Magpul is a great option for you. Well, they came out with this little tiny Magwell for Glocks which I'm going to pick up. I think it's like 20 bucks, And it's a low profile, barely there magwell. Looks like it's going to help quite a bit without sticking out quite a bit. I'm not worried it's made out of plastic because what it's going on is plastic. So <laughs> the rest of the gun is plastic too. So it looks like I'll check that thing out. But the product I am most excited about by far that I want to check out is Ruger's new integrally suppressed 1022 barrel. That thing is awesome. Uh, I cannot wait to pick one of those up. What they did is they took the 1022 takedown model, so you can flip a little lever at the bottom of the 1022 and it twists in half and comes apart. I don't own a takedown 1022. I own a regular 1022. Matter of fact, I have a Magpul stock on it, and I have a carbon fiber barrel on it because it looks cool, and it's a really, really fun gun. I think every red-blooded American should have a 1022 because it's such a neat gun. But I might be getting a new 1022 just so I can have the takedown model. That that feature never really appealed to me until now, is this thing almost looks like a, a, an over and under shotgun. Because what they did is under the barrel, they used all that empty, I guess, usable dead space under a barrel. And they made the baffles inside the internal silencer a, almost like a figure eight shape. So now you get more volume inside the silencer, which by the way is the key for it working, is you actually get more volume in there to trap all the gases. And you don't really take up any space that you really need elsewhere on the outside of the gun. So I think the inside barrel is about 10 and change long, but it's not an NFA firearm because the overall, you know, the outside barrel is over 16 inches. So you get a completely silenced suppressed 22 in a package that is only as long as a 16 inch barrel, which makes it way handier than a normal 16 inch barrel with an extra five or six inches silencer on the end of it. And it's way quieter than a normal silencer on the end of it. One, because you don't have the full 16-inch barrel where some standard velocity ammo for a 22, you know, should be subsonic, but with all that length, sometimes they get up fast enough they can break the sound barrier. So you have a shorter barrel, so you're going to have much, much quieter uh, shots. And then you have a silencer with tons of volume inside because they made use of all that space below the barrel. It's just going to be super quiet, and it looks super cool. So uh, stay tuned as I go buy myself a 10-22 takedown, and then as soon as I can get my hands on one of those uh, integr integrally, that's hard to say, suppressed barrels from Ruger, I'm going to slap one on and show you guys how it works. So I I'm really excited about that. I wanted to make it out to the NRA show to see all these new products. Uh, and I had planned on going until a few months ago. I decided, ah, I'm not going to go. I, I don't need to. It's not really, you know, for me, I I've been enough times. And then a couple weeks before the show, I went, oh, shoot. I should be going. This is a perfect time for a book signing. So guys, I'm so sorry. I promised a bunch of you I was going to be there. And I completely forgot about it. And then by the time I got back ready to want to do a book signing, it was just too late to be able to get enough books in time and make it out there. So I apologize. I will plan now to try and get there for next year for a book signing. Uh, the Long Range Shooting Handbook is doing great. You guys continue to amaze me. Uh, I thought the sales would drop off by now. It's been out for 17 months, and this month has been so far the record month of sales. <laughs> so you guys are spreading the word, and I really appreciate it. Um, about 22, 23,000 copies sold so far. Still a bestseller on Amazon. Please pick it up and check it out if you haven't yet, or at least tell a friend about it. The charities that are supported by it are just super happy with all the support you guys have given. It's been a lot of money raised, so I really appreciate it. And I have some good news about the book. One, the advanced book, not even close to being done. Guys, I'm so sorry. I get an email at least a day 
asking about the advanced version of the book, and I just, I can't seem to get it done. I'm trying, I'm trying, I promise, I'm sorry. I'll get it done soon. I actually just got in and working out through a deal right now through a uh, mainstream publisher to come out with the book, which I'm really excited about. So that'll be three total books, hopefully by, I don't know, six, eight months from now, maybe a full year to get all three uh, books out there. But I'm excited about it. But the good news about the Long Range Shooting Handbook is I'm going to record an audio version. I haven't done it yet because I thought it would be too hard to describe some of the graphs and, and formulas and stuff in the audiobook. But then I realized I don't have to say exactly what's in the book. I can talk, read the book and then I can go off on a tangent if I want. So if you guys want to get the audiobook, I'll be coming out soon. I'll announce it all over Facebook uh, website. You know, I'll do it on this podcast here when it's available. So you'll actually maybe get a different product. You'll get some of my spin or, or offshoot comments about the chapters as I'm going through them, but it will also help you listen to the book like you're listening to this podcast now, which might be in your car on the way to work or in places where it doesn't make sense to sit down and read a book. The other good news is I'm going to offer it for free. So if you haven't signed up for Audible yet, don't. Don't sign up yet because when you sign up with your account, you get your first book free. If you use the link I'm going to give you guys. So I'm going to put the link on Facebook. I'll put it on the website. So you'll have a link that you can click on it. And if you sign up and create your Audible account for the first time, that's Audible, uh, you'll be able to download and get my book completely for free. So free book, not a bad deal. And it might give you a chance to listen or, or reference the material better. I don't know about you, but sometimes having someone explain to me the information you know, that I can hear, it's easier for me to follow along than it is for me to read it because when I'm reading, I tend to daydream sometimes <laughs> or, or you just, I don't know, you get tired. So look for the audiobook coming out soon. I, again, the support you guys have, have given is amazing. Keep checking out rocketffl.com. There's a free trial of all the courses I offer. So you just sign up and click the free trial and it doesn't like cut you off after a certain number of days. It's just a preview. It gives you some of the lessons for free. So sign up and check them out. And if you like it, uh, take the full course and get your FFL. Uh, the most of the comments or questions I get from people are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea I could get my FFL out of my house. Uh, you can. Matter of fact, most of the FFLs out there, according to the ATF, are home-based FFLs. So not only is it not rare, it's actually extremely common. Uh, the only thing you need to worry about is some of your zoning you know, issues you might have with your city, town, or county. And I, I help you work through those or discuss those in the course so you can figure out how to get past that. I mean, I've I've gotten manufacturing licenses in like skyscrapers in downtown major metropolitan areas. So I give you some of those tips and tricks on, on I've used to be able to get around those uh, seemingly uh, hurdles. And what you do then is you get to sign up with distributors. Like I have a connection for you. Uh, you don't have to have a storefront like most people think for distributors. If you go through me, I can get you set up with the distributors I use. And they've already guaranteed me that they will ship no problem to a home-based FFL. So you just get on their website, click the buttons of the guns you want at wholesale prices, and they ship to you. And don't quote me on this, but I think if it's over a $500 order, they ship it for free in two days. It's like Amazon Prime, but for guns. <laughs> so you can get on there and, and get guns, wholesale prices, get free shipping to your house in two days. And you don't have to do any paperwork or go down to the local gun store or pay for transfer fees or anything like that. Matter of fact, you can start charging your friends transfer fees and you can do what I did and get a manufacturer's license because I'm manufacturing firearms, which by the way, my first two bolt guns are in process right now. So within a few weeks, they'll be done. I'll start having some pictures of them out there. Um, I'm going to keep one for me and maybe, I don't know, I'll sell the other one. If you guys are interested, I'll use them for demos and, and maybe raffle one off or sell one off. Now, the markings aren't all my markings yet. There's still some other manufacturer's markings on them because they're the first two trying to get them all figured out. So they're not going to have all the full logos and full everything, but they're still going to be pretty awesome. Um, and the serial number is still going to be uh, Kleckner 1 and Kleckner 2 for the first two samples. So if you think that's cool, uh, awesome. You might be able to get a chance to get a cool gun. So I'll, I am excited to test those out and show you guys how they work. But I have that Type 7 manufacturer's license, not only so I can make the guns, but I can make machine guns. I can make short barreled shotguns. And you could too, if you got one, you literally could decide, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to make a machine gun. And you can go down and take a regular AR-15, drill it out for a sear pin hole with a jig you can find for 40 bucks online, install the full auto parts. Of course, you got to mark it with your manufacturer name. 
And within the next 24 hours, you just got to drop a form two off to the ATF, letting them know you made it. You don't even need permission. You just go, hey guys, guess what? Made a machine gun. And you've got yourself a machine gun. So, I mean, that's kind of a cool reason to have an FFL. I don't know about you. Uh, sorry if I just rambled about new products in this one. I just wanted to get a podcast out because it's been a little bit since I got one out. And I didn't want you guys yelling at me for not having one out there. Again, write in with your ideas. I, I'm happy to hear that you guys are listening. Uh, tell me some points you want me to rehash. I'm like, heck, you know what I might need? I just might need another guest to talk to. Maybe I need to get Jason back on here so I can talk to somebody else. Or I need to invite some other people on. You guys got ideas? Let me know. I appreciate you guys listening. I appreciate your support and everything you guys do. Uh, be safe and take care.